But by God's grace, we're doing that just right now. And the argument sums up during the latter part of this month. In the Supreme Court of Canada, there are nine judges. We have asked that all of the judges sit in the case. Usually they sit in uh, sections of five, but we've asked that all of the judges sit, and uh, the Chief Justice of the court, who incidentally is a French Catholic, Chief Justice Winfrey, granted our order and has decreed that all nine judges sit in the court, or at least as many of them as can attend. So there's our first step, or the first round in this battle in the Supreme Court that we've uh, won. As a matter of fact, in uh, Canada, as you know, they do not have a Bill of Rights. They have no written Bill of Rights. The province of Quebec contends that because of that, the people of Canada do not have freedom of speech, that they cannot worship God according to the dictates of their conscience and that the people must do what the premier and the law officers of the various towns and municipalities of the province say they must do in respect to the distribution of literature or the exercise of these fundamental liberties. As a matter of fact, to the eyes of the person of the world, it looks very dark. But to the eyes of Jehovah God, it is not dark, because there is no darkness to Jehovah, not even when you're in the darkest of all provinces of Canada, the province of Quebec, benighted by the black-skirted and uh, uh, feminine priests that really run the entire province. Now, this case that we have in the Supreme Court originated, as I have mentioned to you, in the city of Quebec. You'll recall some two or three years ago in the winter of 1947 and the uh, spring of 1948, we had this trial in Quebec City. There, upon the occasion of that trial, the city of Quebec brought three expert witnesses. They called them experts. They were nothing more than dumb clergymen. One of them was a Catholic priest, the other was a Jewish rabbi, and the other was the uh, Anglican minister of the Anglican uh, church in Montreal. And all of these ministers came on one right after another and testified to the judge who swallowed it hook, line, sinker, and all that Jehovah's Witnesses weren't religious because they didn't believe like the priests and the clergy do, that they didn't preach because we didn't preach like they did, and that we weren't uh, even religious because we didn't believe like they did. And of course, we took these preachers on cross-examination and uh, using the word of God, we cut them to pieces and made them look ridiculous. And uh, at the first day of the trial in that case, which was in a fairly large courtroom, we had over 65 Catholic priests that surrounded the courtroom and came in there apparently for the show or else to put Catholic pressure on the Catholic judge who was under about all the pressure that it was possible for a judge to be under. But nevertheless, they were there. And it was on that occasion that uh, uh, I was called to the stand and while on the stand they tried to uh, embarrass the organization and me as a representative of the society and Jehovah's Witnesses by pointing out that we call the Catholic Church the old harlot, and uh, uh, a lot of other things, and I said, well, uh, uh, yes, that's true, we stand by that, we never have drawn that back, and not only that, there's a whole lot more we've got, we've got to say about the Roman Catholic Church and the false doctrines that they're advocating to the people. And so, you'd be surprised, the Roman Catholic 
magazine, or rather a newspaper in Quebec City printed all this testimony and there was a farmer about 60 miles from Quebec City that read the newspaper and was so struck by this testimony that had been reproduced in the newspapers, he jumped on the train and came down to the court, and to this day that man is in the truth, believe it or not. And so we didn't back down one inch, although we were surrounded by steeples. When you'd look out our hotel room there in Quebec City, and look out uh, over the top of the buildings, you could see the Catholic steeples about as thick as wheat in a wheat field. And uh, priests were running with their skirts up and down the halls and the streets and everything else, but by God's grace, we had the privilege of setting the skirts to fire right there that day in that courtroom. And so now, all that testimony, including the ridiculous testimony of the priest and the Anglican minister and the Jewish rabbi that were torn to threads by God's Word, the Bible, is now before the Supreme Court of Canada, and you can be sure that those nine judges are really going to get an eye full when they read that record. Because in addition to that, we've got all of the publications of the society, including religion and is hell hot and purgatory and all the other things that uh, really burns the religious doctrines to pieces. In addition to that, we have, by the help of Jehovah God, produced a written argument in the Supreme Court of Canada. In this country, they call it a brief, but I'll guarantee you that this document isn't brief because Premier Duplessy has raised against us some 50 or 60 technicalities and points to contend that Jehovah's Witnesses are not entitled to have any freedom in the province of Quebec. And by God's grace, we have corralled the Premier on every one of his points, and we hope to use this two-volume document of 900 pages, which weighs about nine pounds, and cram it right down his throat and get the assistance of the Supreme Court of Canada on the proposition, too. As a matter of fact, we rely on Blackstone, who says that laws like this were invalid back in England in 1700 and something. Yet today they claim they've got the right to do what the medieval rulers of England couldn't do, according to Blackstone, and deprive the people of their liberties. Plus that, we've got a lot of other arguments, and of course you can see that I would never be able to stop if I were to start repeating what we've said in all those 900 pages. I merely say this, that although we may be in the land of the enemy there, Although uh, Quebec City might be 99% Catholic, as they claim, and the province of Quebec may be 85% Catholic or more, they fail to forget that Jehovah God is the one that's back of us. He's all-powerful. And because the brothers of Quebec have not let down, they haven't let Jehovah God down, we didn't let him down on the trial, and by God's grace, we haven't let the truth down or the law down to this moment, and we can be sure that Jehovah the Almighty God will not let us down when the final day of decision comes in this case. We've seen the Lord's hand in the matter thus far, and since the Lord's hand has been with us in our walking through this wilderness up there in that blight benighted despicable province that has segregated itself from the rest of Canada, we can be sure that he will continue to walk with us. And so we put the matter in the Lord's hands. As a matter of fact, 
the Catholic Church and the priests have no courage. They fight behind closed doors when they're in a land like this, when there's constitutional liberties. When they're in a land like Quebec, they come out into the open and resort to all manner of falsehoods and violence and illegal arguments and exert unfair influence to deprive people of their liberties. And we're against that sort of a thing. But remember this, that Jehovah God has pictured this crowd. And I'll read to you what Jehovah says about this type of fighters that we've got to deal with. In Jeremiah the 50th to 35 to 38, it says, A sword is upon the Chaldeans, says Jehovah, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, and upon her princes, and upon her wise men. A sword is upon the boasters, and they shall become fools. A sword is upon her mighty men, and they shall be dismayed. A sword is upon the boasters, and they shall become fools, and they shall not prosper. A sword is upon their horses, and upon their chariots, and upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her, and they shall become as a woman. A sword is upon her treasures, and they shall be robbed. And Jeremiah, again, at 50th to 30th chapter, says that the mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They remain in their stronghold. Their might has failed. They are become as women. And that's exactly the situation that the Roman Catholic Church is in when it comes to the truth. They're never able to meet one of Jehovah's Witnesses face to face. When they come face to face with the truth, it's just like that Catholic priest up there in that court in Quebec. He took off and went soaring into the skies, into the stratosphere, and spoke about philosophy for about 45 minutes, and nobody could understand him, not even the judge. So, it's like when a fighter gets into the ring, you expect to be met by men. But what do we find we're fighting against? Not men, but women. And they expose themselves as such, and they're disgraceful because of their feminine attire and their feminine conduct. They think now that they've got us surrounded. As a matter of fact, they thought when they started these cases back in Quebec in 1946, a big bunch of them, on down to this day, that they build a great big high platform, a gallow that they put on it. But don't you know that Haman also built a gallow for Mordecai, Mordecai? And do you remember what happened? Did Mordecai hang? No. Haman hung on his own gallows, and by God's grace, the Roman Catholic hierarchy in Quebec will hang on its own gallows in the Supreme Court of Canada by the God's grace as well as before the whole universe. And the Lord will be us in this fight as long as we take the offense. The Lord is never for us when we start retreating. Remember that in your own personal lives. This organization has never taken a retreating stand on any of the important issues of the truth, has it? No, sir. By God's grace, we stood for square for the truth and God's word and haven't even backed down in the face of death itself. And by God's grace, we'll never continue to do so. And as long as we take the offense, just like Ehud took, he took the sword and plunged it deep into the belly, the fat belly of Eglon, the fat belly of religion we're giving the sword to now, and we're causing all the dirt to come out before the eyes of the people of goodwill so that they can see now that this, this is the truth. And we're fighting for that liberty to take that offense against that faceless, dishonest, corrupt organization so that the people of goodwill who love righteousness can see the truth and take their stand on the side of Jehovah God. And the fight that we're carrying on now in Quebec reminds me 
of the fight that's going on in Germany, Eastern Germany today. You brothers will recall from the talk that the two wagon boys gave to you of the many experiences that our brothers have gone through now in these modern times in Eastern Germany, and I won't take the time to repeat any of them. As a matter of fact, you brothers may think like we did when we first heard of the attendance out here in Los Angeles, that the Los Angeles Assembly was the largest in the world of these district assemblies. But do you know where the largest one was held? Berlin, 16,000 attended the district assembly there. And before I left Brooklyn, word came through, according to information that I was given, that a special convention was held in the Western Zone, and 63,000 publishers were present at that assembly, and that didn't take in the brothers from the Eastern Zone of Germany. So you can see that the progress is on in Germany. There they do not have all of the material benefits that we have here in the way of cars, in the way of uh, the material things that make life comfortable. And they live under adversity because they have the communistic red sickle and hammer opposing them at every turn. But by God's grace, it's just exactly coming to pass, notwithstanding these adversities and obstacles, exactly as I told you brothers out at Wrigley Field here in Los Angeles in 1947, which is this. We'd better watch out here in this country even though we have, do have a large number of publishers now or else, if we don't put the steam on now and keep our numbers proportionately, we'll have only a rear view of our German brothers in this march into the new world. So, let us put on the steam. Let us take the example, the modern day example that our brothers in Germany have given us. They have put kingdom interests first. They have taken to heart the scripture, Seek ye first the kingdom, and all other things will be added. And they've seen all things added. As a matter of fact, our brothers in Germany know this, that automobiles will not get them into the new world. They know that radios and televisions will not bring them protection at the Battle of Armageddon. They know that fine homes and big jobs and large purse will not excuse them from the commands of Almighty God. They know that there's only one thing that will bring them peace of mind now and security in the day that is to come, and that is putting the hand to the plow and keeping it there all the time and making all other things secondary. Now that doesn't necessarily mean to say that we ought to walk out of this auditorium and start scuttling our families and our obligations. No. It means merely this, that if we follow and take to heart what the German brothers are doing now today, and we ought to because we see the Lord's blessing upon that. His Spirit is upon their work there. If we take to heart those things, then we'll do the same thing that they're doing because they're doing what the Lord Jesus Christ admonished them to do. So they've set us a good example. Now, before I stop talking on this German situation, I wouldn't want to, as I've said, repeat a lot of these modern experiences. I was over in uh, Germany last year. I was at uh, Wiesbaden in Frankfurt. And while there, I was talking with Brother Frost, you know, is the branch servant in Germany. He's a man that's learned how to speak the English language 
in his middle age on his own efforts and through no help of anyone else except books and whatever help he can get from the brothers around the branch office, and he's now able to read and write the German language. But Brother Frost was the one that was among the 50 brothers that was running the underground work in Germany in 1937 when he was arrested by the Hitler Gestapo one night. He was caught the first night that he slept. All the other time he'd been riding the train every night, but finally he met some circus servants and uh, spent a night in a room, and when he did that at 2 o'clock in the morning, the head of the Gestapo flashed the light on in his face. He says, Herr Frost, you have played the music and I have danced for three years while you've run this underground organization. Now I'm going to play the music and you'll dance. And so they took him to court and tried him and finally he wound up with 50 other brothers in the, in the uh, concentration camps in Germany. And so after being in this worst concentration camp in Germany and considered to be an incorrigible along with 50 other brothers, they were put over on the Channel Islands. And the Channel Islands were directly in the path of the Allies when the invasion came into Normandy. All the other islands around there were bombed, but this island was not. And Brother Frost wondered, why not? So last summer, while we were in the Bethel, Brother Frost and Brother Rudiman, who is from the Swiss office, and I were talking over his experiences when they came out of uh, the concentration camp after the fall in Germany. And Brother Rudiman told Brother Frost that the letter that he had handed to a friendly... F.S. man, who had come over to this island for a special message, who was friendly to Jehovah's Witnesses, was taken back to France, deposited in the mails, and went to Bern, and there Brother Rudiman went to the uh, ambassador of the American government and handed this letter over to him, and it described that all of the prisoners on that island and all the work that was there was a mere concentration camp. It wasn't a German... Uh, military base. And this information was turned over then to the Allies, and it was because that message got out that they were spared from destruction by bombs on that island, which shows you that Jehovah God protects his people in the time of great disaster. So, Brother Frost was greatly elated over learning how his letter had gotten into the hands and how God had used this SS man to get this information into the mails in France and on to Switzerland and then how Brother Rudiman took it to the American legation and on into the military authorities in England and spared them from bombing. But perhaps you'd like to know now a very interesting story of how Jehovah God preserved the nucleus of the organization that started out in Germany when the liberation came in 1945. That story hasn't been told in its great detail. Brother Frost told it to me in 1947. He again repeated it last year to Brother Rudiman when we were talking about this matter in the, the battle at Wiesbaden, Germany. And I'll give you some of the highlights. Now, when the invasion was started and the Allies started softening up the coast of Normandy with bombs and gunfire and all that sort of thing, and airplane raids, the Gestapo and the SS men got scared. And they took uh, all these prisoners on this island, including these 50 brothers, among whom were the present-day circuit servants and district servants and members of the Bethel family in Wiesbaden, and these men, Gestapo, knew that Jehovah's Witnesses had God's favor on them, because what did they do? They took Jehovah's Witnesses out 
and put them in every boat where the SS men were riding, showing that they were afraid that if they didn't have Jehovah's Witnesses in the boat with them, that God wouldn't protect them. So their fears were correct. The boats were not sunk, and some of the other boats in which Jehovah's Witnesses were not were sunk. And the Gestapo saw that happen, and the SS men saw that happen the very night before they moved this great mass of prisoners, 50 of whom were Jehovah's Witnesses. Then when they got on the coast of Normandy and started into the east, they were put onto these prisoner trains, prisoner of war trains. And they had Jehovah's Witnesses uh, scattered out in the cars where the SS men were so that uh, uh, they would get whatever protection would come to them and the airplanes would sweep down and shoot the engines off as they were retreating. The Allies would sweep in and shoot the engines off. The train would uh, be stopped and the army would move up and they'd bring another engine on, so on, until finally they got ahead of the marching armies. And as the uh, Russians came in from the east and the American Patton's Army from the west. They, this SS uh, train started zigzagging back across Germany and finally it wound up down in the northern part of Austria. And uh, as the fall was approaching, the fall of the German Reich was approaching, these SS men put these brothers, 50 of them, in a strange concentration camp where there was not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, all strangers. Poles were in that camp, and Russians by the thousands, and a few, about 1,500 Germans of various uh, uh, stripes of uh, political prisoners, none of whom were Jehovah's Witnesses, some Jews. Then the SS men abandoned that camp. They ran off and left it. When they ran off and left it, why then there was a vote taken by the Poles and Russians, and they got charge of that camp and took the guns of the Gestapo and the SS men and began to wear them. And they took government control of that camp, ruled it by an iron hand, worse than the SS men, as a matter of fact. So uh, they got uh, drunk on wood alcohol that was in the tank car on the outside, these men did, and they were actually frothing at the mouth because they were insane. And Brother Frost and these 50 brothers put their uh, blankets and their clothing on the trailer that they had, a four-wheeled trailer without any manpower, and pushed it down to the gate of this concentration camp. And the commander, like mad, came down to them, frothing at the mouth, and said, you people are not going to get out of here speaking through an interpreter. He was speaking Russian. And uh, so uh, some people who were in this mob that was about to mob uh, the brothers at this gate of this concentration camp spoke up in Russian, uh, in Polish, which the Russian could understand, and they said, why, these Jehovah's Witnesses are all right. They're not like the rest of the Germans that are in this camp. We know a lot of those people back in the concentration camp in Poland where they brought us from here. So uh, all of a sudden the uh, commandant swung the door open and out the brothers went free, and that very night, every one of the Germans, 900, were killed. And you can see killed and massacred. And you can see how Jehovah God pulled them out of that concentration camp just in the nick of time. And here they were, liberated, no money, no clothes, no horses, no manpower, and they started pulling this trailer over the mountain roads in the northern part of Austria, headed to Munich. The American military was running up and down the highway, and a captain, or rather a major, stopped and said to the brothers, says, why do you fellas pull that? They had signs on the side, Jehovah's Witnesses released from concentration camps to identify them from other people. They had also their striped uniforms on, too, you see. So uh, the sign, Jehovah's Witnesses, give them a pass to go right on down the road without being stopped. So uh, the brother said, well, we don't have any way of pulling it. So the major says there's three army horses 
back down here at a certain farmer's house, he gave the description. It says, you can go down there, I'll give you an order. It says, those are Hungarian army horses belonging to the German army. We've confiscated them, I'll give you an order for them. So the brothers took the order, they went down there at the farmer's house, and there was the horses there, but there was no harness. So they threatened the farmer, and finally he told them where the harness was. So then they went on down the road to another farmhouse to get this harness, and just as they turned off the road, they saw a tractor, a German tractor, putt-putt tractor down in this deep ditch. And it uh, was buried in there, and along come another major, and they asked him if they could get that tractor out, could they have it? He said, yes, it looked like an impossible job. One of the brothers was an engineer, and he figured out with push and precision how to get that tractor out. And they did get it out. But after they got it out, they didn't have any gasoline. But they knew that there was fuel buried around there somewhere because this tractor had been abandoned. Now, what happened? The brothers went on down to this farmhouse with this harness and uh, put pressure on this farmer and told him they were going to take the horses if he didn't cough up and tell them where the gasoline was. So they made a deal with the farmer, gave him the horses, he kept the harness, they got the gasoline and put it in the tractor and the whole crowd of them went right on into Munich. So you can see how the Lord preserved those brothers in the midst of adversity. Watch to their every physical need. All those dark years when the Gestapo and the SS men were trying to kill them by beating them to death and starving them to death. And you'd like to know how the brothers didn't starve to death on this concentration camp in the Channel Islands. Well, I'll tell you how it happened. One day, Brother Frost took it, who had taken his uh, accordion along with him was playing at night, uh, in the evening. He was playing after they'd been working in this rock quarry all day. Beautiful music. He's a marvelous musician. Plays the opera pieces, the uh, the waltzes, and all the uh, higher type of music. And he did it so well that the commandant of the concentration camp heard him, and he sent his. Uh, SS mount out, he says, go get that man and bring him in here. He says, I want to save him because he plays the music I like to hear. So they put Brother Frost in the kitchen, the commissary, and Brother Frost stole food for those three or four years that kept all the other 50 brothers alive. Well, Today we see the prospering in Germany. We see Adolf Hitler and the Gestapo and the SS men dead. All their proud and haughty faces are now under the earth. And they're pushing up daisies now and Jehovah's Witnesses are going like a house of fire in Germany, still alive. And it proves to us this one thing that the Spirit of Almighty God is stronger when poured out upon just mere weak flesh than is swords and bullets and all the munition and the tanks and every other sort of instrumentality that the devil can think of manufacturing. There is absolutely no weapon formed against God's people that will be able to stop them. And the German brothers have proved that to us right here in our own day to add to all that marvelous story that Jehovah God has caused to be recorded in the Bible. Well, I could go on for a long time talking about other countries, showing you that God has not left us without modern day examples. We want proof. God has given us to us in the Bible, but God has not stopped giving us proof that he's with his organization even in this time. All you have to do is notice the reports that appear in the watchtower. Read the reports and the, the cases that are reported on in the awake. Study the reports in the yearbook and you have every type of proof 
that this is God's organization and nothing can stop it. So what other proof do we want? God has given us everything to back up and to prove true his word that he would never abandon his people. Now, even in this country, we're not without our difficulties. Of course it's true here in the United States that we do not have the severe persecution that our brothers in Germany are having today. But let us not be dismayed. We are confronted with evidence that the enemy is still with us. With us. Do you think that Satan loves Jehovah's Witnesses in the United States more than he does in Germany? Well, of course you know that he doesn't. He hates them just as much. We're just as much despised as our brothers are in Germany. We continue to have inroads sweep in in the way of encroachments in an effort to take away the massive bulwark or bastion that Jehovah God has built around his organization in the United States. Jehovah God put his organization here in the United States for a certain purpose, didn't he? Did you ever stop to think why it is that Jehovah God put his organization here? Did you ever stop to think why it is that today in this country we do not have all the persecution sweeping in upon us like it was in 1940, 41, and 42, and 3 when we thought the whole organization was going to be swept out? When we thought Armageddon was around the corner? When we thought everything was going to be folded up? Why didn't Jehovah God put his organization in London? Why didn't he put it in Berlin? Why didn't he locate it in Asia? Why didn't he locate it in Europe, some other place? Or in Africa or Australia? The answer is quite obvious now to all of us. That there is really only one country in the, uni uh, in the whole world where that Jehovah's Witnesses can go into the arena and battle it out blow by blow with the government over their encroachments against God's organization. Do you think we could have done in England or some of the other countries what we did here in the United States in 1940, 41 and 42 and 43? No. Today you can see again why it is that Jehovah God has his organization here in the United States. The dollar is the medium of exchange in the world. And how could we preach the gospel in all the world without the aid of the American dollar that comes from 117 and 124 Columbia Heights that spreads into all the whole world, this gospel? Can't you see that God knew what he was doing when he put his organization here? Certainly you can. The very fact it's here ought to be proof, but it's well for us to take into account why Jehovah God has located his organization in this country. Would we be where we are if we were in Russia? Would we be where we are if we had been located in Germany? Would we be where we are if we were located in Asia, some poor country, worn out to the right, down to the very bone? No. God has put his organization here so that everything that's needed to carry out this commission, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, can be done at this time of the end. The gospel shall be preached. The good news will be taken to every corner of Christendom where God has promised that it must go before the end comes. And <clears throat> when
when we look back over the record of our fighting since 1940 to 43 and on down to this day, brother, we have a tendency to take things as a matter of course. Some of you are new in the truth and are not familiar with all the history that some of us that are a little older, I might say, in the truth. Well, reco uh, do not recollect what took place, but we put up a, we had a terrible ordeal in this country in 1940. Mobs by the hundreds. A total of 2,500 mobs in the course of three years. As many as 2,000 or more arrests every year. But finally, we kept pushing on by God's grace, not turning back, not stopping, going on from door to door, knocking on the doors, presenting the literature, arrests after arrests, mobs after mobs, appeals after appeals, and went to the Supreme Court of the United States and boldly presented our case, trusting in Jehovah God, and were turned down. And then we went back again with a petition for rehearing, and the Supreme Court reversed itself. And in one day, in 1943, the Supreme Court handed down some 13 different decisions. And the clerk of the Supreme Court to me said, well, Mr. Covington, you've had a field day today. And since that time, the victory has been rolling in the direction of our liberty. Now, why do I mention these things to you, brothers? so that we do not take these matters for granted. We ought to appreciate that we happen to be living in this time of the end when this good news is being preached in all the world as a witness. We ought to count it a privilege that we're associated with brothers like we have in Germany who are giving their all and putting the kingdom under his first. Who are not plagued with all the difficulties that we are in this country. We ought to be thankful to Jehovah the Almighty God that we're living in this country where the God has his organization, where he's protecting it for the purpose that this good news will be proclaimed in all the world as a witness. If we were in some other country, we wouldn't find that protection. And since we are fortunate enough to be where God is protecting the headquarters of his organization during this period of the gospel preaching, we ought to do something about it, don't you think, to show God that we appreciate it? The devil... According to 1 Peter 5, 8, is what? Peter says, keep your senses, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking to devour someone. And we might add, every one of the Lord's people. Now today, are we thrown into concentration camps in this country? No. Why? Because this bastion of liberty that God has built up through the Supreme Court decisions holds the enemy off. But are we without temptation? Are we without trial? Are we absolutely without any trouble in keeping our covenant? Our trouble in this country is not persecution just now, but our trouble is temptation just now, and that's just about three times worse than persecution, isn't it? It reminds me of what Brother Frost asked me when we were riding on the road from uh, Hanover uh, down to Essen in 1947, just when we were uh, reorganizing the work in Germany, he said to me, he says, Brother Covington, did the American people suffer during the war like the German people? I said, Brother Frost, why, yes, they did. The women couldn't buy nylon hose. 
We couldn't buy all the automobiles we wanted, and we were restricted in the gasoline. And that's about all, except for the people who lost their loved ones on foreign battlefields. So Brother Frost said, perhaps someday the American nation will suffer like the German people have suffered and like the German brothers have had to go through. You might think, well, that's our grace. But is that scriptural? I say to you tonight, as we are together here in this auditorium, our arena, that God has prophesied that the people in this country as well as all the witnesses in every other country under the sun will be subjected to the cruelties and the tortures and the trouble that the German brothers are going through today and which they had to go through under the Nazi rule. Well now you think I'm just a sour grape eater or Sure, but I'll tell you now that there is scripture behind it. Remember the story of King Hezekiah and King Sennacherib? It's reported in the Second Kings. This prophecy was written upon extensively in the Watchtower in 1944. It pictures King Sennacherib coming down against Judah with all of his forces and besieging the city and then moving off. That pictured the time of trouble down to 1944. And then the change and the withdrawal. But the scripture goes on to show that King Sennacherib later on brought all of his forces and the forces of his allies down to Judah and besieged the whole city. And, of course, we know what happened after that. Jehovah God delivered them miraculously. But that second besieging, according to the Watchtower pictures, that before Armageddon, all these fiery troubles that we went through in 1943 that were terminated about that time will come back upon us tenfold before Armageddon, just like Sennacherib increased his forces when he came against God's organization in the times of old. So, with that sort of a situation in mind, remember that it is vitally important to now so conduct ourselves that we might be found well within the bounds of Jehovah's organization when the trouble comes. We ought to have in mind that even though we do not have our brothers in concentration camps now in this country, that we have other troubles. Remember what Peter said, the roaring lion? What does the lion do in the forest? He sticks his mouth, turns his mighty jaws and his open mouth down towards the earth and roars and thunders and shakes the trees and the forest, even by his mighty roar that comes seemingly to all the animals in the forest from all directions. And the animals start running, running helter-skelter, and they run right into the mouth of the lion because of their fear. They don't know which way the lion is coming. So it is with the devil. He doesn't come at the large organization with jails and persecutions and concentration camps alone. No. He comes at Jehovah's people in other ways. He comes disguised as a brother. Comes disguised as a friend. Comes disguised with benefits and advantages, more money, prosperity, new automobiles, 
All the radios and television sets we want. All the fine clothes. All the fine entertainment and everything else that you can think of that uh, deadens a person's mind and interest in the truth. Now, I'm not standing here uh, uh, as a one who is condemning all that sort of a thing. I think it's all right for a person to have a radio or a television if they can afford it. The important thing is not to let those things keep you from being the best publisher in the company, isn't it? And Mark, you this, that if we do not alert ourselves and become conscious of the fact that we are actually opposed on all sides and have all sorts of temptations here in this land of liberty, in this place where God has protected his organization, if you don't alert yourself to that, then sure you're going to be sucked under in this violent torrent and current that's sweeping the people down to the Dead Sea because the enemy, Satan the devil, is subtle. He knows that he can't come to you and say, well, here, you quit the truth. He knows he can't come to you and say, well, I'm going to run you out of the truth by throwing you in jail. He knows that that would be too foolish. He's tried that and failed, so now he's going to try to get us some other way in this country. And I say to you now, regardless of whether we have good clothes on our back, whether we have money in our pocket, whether we own a home or are able to rent a fine home and run a good automobile and have all the things of life that make life comfortable, I say to you now, brother, let each and every one of us determine that we're going to put kingdom interests first and that we're not going to let television sets, radios, fine homes, and automobiles or anything else be in first place. Now, is that your attitude? Let it... Let us keep the kingdom interest first and prove to Jehovah God our faith and our belief like our German brothers by putting the kingdom interest first. We've got to do this, else we're going to be a way back down the ladder when we start climbing into the new world of righteousness. And by the Lord's grace, we don't want to sit down and let anybody get ahead of us, do we? We're not competing with anybody. But the fact of the matter is, we certainly don't want to be found ashamed when we appear before the Almighty God and the King, Son, Christ Jesus, do we? For if we carry out a course of action that proves that we're behind the, our other brothers and are ashamed of the Lord and Jehovah, then he'll be ashamed of us at the time the righteous executioner goes forth. And I say to you, and I pray to you, brothers, that, and to Jehovah God, that every one of us avoid these pitfalls that the devil is putting for us, and let's keep our stand firm inside God's organization and never tarry from it right down to the very end and prove the devil to be a liar, which he is. Now, in this country, Today, the enemy is trying to take away, bit by bit, some of our liberties, some of our victories, some of the bastion or the bulwark that Jehovah has put around the organization. I'm not going to take time to detail all of the cases we've been fighting the last few years. I'll merely mention this, that the devil is not going to go running into the court and say, we're going to take everything. No. He starts taking an inch. And if he takes an inch, he'll take a mile, won't he? Open in this country as long as it's humanly possible to do so, and as long as Jehovah wills that it be open. And therefore, we must fight. In the Supreme Court of the United States, now we have two cases that are very important. They involve the right to do or hold public meetings in the public parks. One case comes from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The other comes from uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The states in these cases are contending 
that Jehovah's Witnesses have no right to use public property because we are a religious organization. Usually they say we're not a religious organization, but this time they say we are. They argue that because we are a religious organization, if we use public property, that constitutes a violation of the theory of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution that forbids the joinder of church and state. In other words, we're making use of church property, or rather of state property and state money for religious purposes in violation of the Constitution. Perfectly ridiculous, isn't it? For if they can succeed on that point, then they can go a step further, can't they? and say that when you're standing on the street corners distributing the watchtower in the awake that you're using public property in violation of the joinder of church and state doctrine. Now, that is absolutely silly. But do you know that the Supreme Court of Rhode Island and the Supreme Court of New Hampshire swallowed that doctrine? Cook, line, sinker, and all? And in doing it, they look as ridiculous as the little cotton-mouth water moxen that swallowed the jackrabbit. And by God's grace, we're going, through the help of Jehovah, meet that argument head-on, and we pray that the Lord will decapitate it right there before the nine young men in the Supreme Court of the United States, even though they are practically all appointees of King Harry the First.